Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is Incident Response Cyber Attack Response Workshop. Speaking today will be Mark Sangster. Mark is an industry security strategist and cybersecurity evangelist who researches, speaks, and writes about cybersecurity as it relates to regulations, ethical obligations, data breach, incident response, and cyber risk management. Mark's 20 year career was established with industry giants like Intel, Cisco, and Blackberry where he worked on the first secure devices for government agencies. Mark continues to build mutually beneficial relationships with regulatory agencies and industry associations, drawing on his strong technical aptitude and intuitive understanding of information security. As an ILTA council member, Mark regularly attended legal tech conferences, delivering talks and workshops, including a 23-stop ILTA roadshow in 2017, and he continues to lead webinars focusing on cybersecurity challenges facing the legal industry. Mark is also a member of the American Bar Association, Income Security Advocacy Center, and the Association of Legal Administrators. He is also a National Law Journal Award recipient. The presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter your questions into the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We're recording this webinar and we'll be sending a video and a follow-up email in a few days. We'll also post the video on our blog at www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us. We'll now begin the webinar. All right, thank you, Austin. Um, thanks for joining me today, where we're going to take a quick whirlwind tour and sort of dip our toes into incident response and what they look like. Um, so the data that I'm going to show you today does come from our security operations centers, and I do want to uh, reiterate that the, the story, the complexity, and how it progressed is actually all, it is all factual. All the technical details that come out are 100% factual, they are not made up. The only thing that has been changed is of course the background scenario, it is representative still, and the name of the firms that were involved in this story. So just to set the stage very quickly, I mean, we've talked about this in many of the other webinars that we've done, um, but criminals are no longer really stumbling across their victims, right? They've moved out of that opportunistic, you know, generic kind of phishing campaigns into the more industry focused types of attacks that we've seen. Uh, that have focused around bar associations, specific geographies, you know, purport um, uh, legal actions against the firms, et cetera, um, and not just for the law firm themselves, but also to actually gain access to their clients' information, which then can be used by criminals to commit larger crimes, such as front-running trades and insider trading on the stock market, of which we've seen plenty of those kind of stories. And of course, over time, the cost of security um, events has increased. And this top line really is to show you, and the point is, as the numbers get larger, is to say, the faster you catch something, the less it's going to cost you. That the further it goes into your burrows, into your network and your, your organization, the more it takes to, to clean it up, to make sure that, it, that you have eradicated the pests. And, you know, of course, the, the dollars keep on ticking as the clock runs. And then the bottom numbers are all real life examples of um, funds that were either stolen or lost billable hours or regulatory penalties and so on that have been paid out. Um, interestingly, more and more firms I'm finding are, are less driven by regulatory penalties and they're moving towards what I consider a more self-actualized approach, which is the concept of understanding how, um, how costly reputational damage can be and also operational disruption, uh, especially when, it, of course, it affects your client base. Now, to start with, of course, the American Bar Association has their cybersecurity handbook, and one of the major sections on it is about incident response and threat intelligence and so on. So I'd certainly recommend, if you haven't read the book, that you take a look. Um, it does certainly dive into this, um, uh, this area in some um, specifics. The other uh, document that I would refer you to is the NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, also has some strong guidelines around um, incident response in the IT uh, world and you know what you should be doing there and, and, and it, there's some pretty solid guidelines. Now of course the first thing you really have to do is to understand what kind of security events look like, right? Are these minor things like violations of policies? Are they right up into you know the massive, let's call it the Ocean's Eleven type of sophisticated attack against your organization that now poses a significant threat to your, to your firm and to your clients, um, you know, livelihood and wherewithal and, and reputation and so on. And, you know, in each incident, every one of them is, is, is an event, is something legit. What's important here is to understand and to pre-plan how you handle each level, 
You know, this may be a warning that goes to a manager. This may be a monthly report. It may be up to, it does not matter that it is a national holiday at 4 a.m. in the morning. You pick up the phone and you're dialing your sort of internal 911 kind of number, right? And, you know, and hitting the alarm bells. And those are really, while there's some good guidelines, GDPR, actually the general data protection rules that have come out in the EU, while they're not U.S. specific, are actually quite useful because they do some good, uh, a good job of actually defining what they consider security events and how severe they are, as does NIST. NIST has some guidelines around this as well. Now, I'm not going to belabor this because this is going to get explored during our scenario that we go into, but just like the rest of cybersecurity and security and the protection of your client's information, it is an entire team sport. Right. There's, you know, everybody always, I think, unfortunately, myopically thinks about this as a technical IT problem. And it's not. That's just one facet of it. Human resources may be involved if employee information has been leaked. That's HIPAA. Or if um, if it's an insider and you believe that someone through either ignorance or or mal you know, malice has acted against your organization, in which case, of course, there's going to be legal ramifications there. There's your communications team, both internal and external, the management team that has to determine, you know, when to when to pull those alerts and when to pull the triggers and and what to do and to make sure the adequate resources are there. And there's also, of course, the uh, the board and your legal counsel, your general counsels um, to make sure that you have this holistic approach and never forget that all of that sits on top of a foundation of your vendors and consultants, right? In an interconnected world, you're as only strong as your weakest link. And often these breaches may occur through a third party. So you need to understand what your legal obligations are with them, what contractual obligations you've put into place as far as things like them notifying you of a potential event, notifying you of a significant event, and notifying you of what the consequences of the severity of that event are. What kind of information has been stolen, how long it's been accessed, how many data records have been affected, et cetera. These are the things you need to know to determine the severity of this, and that in turn, based on certain regulatory requirements, state laws, et cetera, particularly the kind of laws that are coming in in California now, um, their Privacy Act that'll come in in a year, for uh, just over a year from now, um, will really dictate the types of response and actions you have to take when it comes to notifications and potentially making your client base whole again. Now, this is a real, uh, uh, this is one of the pages out of our incident response um, playbook. Um, this is a, you know, a 40, 50 page document that goes into um, the details of how you'd respond. And frankly, there's lots of planning things like making sure you have your, your alert team and who's responsible for each one of those pillars that I described. Um, and then depending on the scenario, is it, you know, is it ransomware? Is it an outsider? Is it an insider? Is it a nation state? All these kind of things. It has all the trigger and the question, you know, the, the sort of the flow chart that you have to go through in determining your actions, next stages, escalations, and so on. I want to show you it's complicated. It isn't that simple as what we're about to go through. But for sake of time and clarity, we just need to sort of like hit the high notes here so that we all get the message and we all understand what some of the implications are. But this document is certainly available for your reference. And anybody who'd like a copy of it, please contact us through the contact information in the ABA, and they will, um, we, would, we would gladly send you this document. This is the simplification. And really, at the end of the day, it's three big buckets. Preparation, right? As first responders will tell you, you know, two thirds of your work should be in preparation. One third is the actually dealing with the crisis or the emergency. Um, the more you prepare, the less it's going to cost you in the long run. Of course, the meat and the stressful part of this is always going to occur during the, you know, the identify, the detect, the contain, and the recover stage. And recovering also includes notifications. So internal, external communications to potential clients and partners. And if it comes to it, regulatory authorities, um, law enforcement. And then in the end, not as a blame game, but going back and reviewing and saying, okay, given that this has occurred, what lessons did we learn? Did our tools and tactics and methodologies work? Where did we struggle? Where did we not have answers? Or where did we lose time because we weren't adequately prepared? Um, these are all the questions to go in, not as a blame game, but more to ensure that this never happens again. And going back to my first responders analogy, it's exactly what they do. They call it after action reporting. This is a non-finger pointing um, exercise for everybody to say, you know what, when we came under fire, when we dealt with the car accident, 
you know, this went well, but we also noticed people didn't know their role here. We didn't have somebody, you know, set up a blockade to keep, you know, oncoming traffic out of our hair as we were trying to deal with the emergency. Things like that. First responders over time have learned these lessons very well. They're very hardened and they use muscle memory to respond. You kind of have to, you know, acclimate yourself in the same way and work yourself to that kind of presence of mind, knowing what you need to do and trusting your gut and trusting the skills that you've trained on to react because that's what will get you through, particularly when the heat is on. Now, some super quick recommendations here. The first thing, of course, is you know setting your triggers, understanding the breach determinations, understanding which ones are severe, which ones are you know reporting or notifications, how as things escalate, because you know what, you don't get 100% of the answers immediately. This is a bit like that old board game clue, you know, with Professor Plum and Miss Scarlet and the pipe and the pistol and the rope and all that kind of thing. That as you go, you get little pieces that help you infer what's happening. And you use deductive reasoning to continue to determine what's happening. But the reality is it's not like somebody's going to give you a cheat sheet ahead of time and tell you what is, right? So you are going to stumble upon this. Um, and as you go, you may think it's one thing. You may think it's an insider, but it turns out it's not um, and vice versa. And these are the sorts of things you really have to understand. How do you escalate so that everybody knows there is no question. The last thing you want is someone in a lower level position who detects something and unfortunately actually finds that, you know, that crumb that's a clue and doesn't act on it because they're not sure what to do. Um, that is the worst case. That is shooting yourself in the, in the foot, proverbially, um, because you could have caught something and you could have reduced the response time and the mediation time, but you didn't. And that's not their fault. That's the incident response planning group's responsibility or fault to make sure that they know what to do. Um, everyone should know their roles and responsibilities. Big hint here is investigation toolkits and war rooms. Having that stuff set up, having a room you know you can go into that is the right network access. If you need new clean devices that you may have to do test work on because you can't rely on your existing network, buy them, configure them, and stick them away. They should be ready to go. This is just like a full fire extinguisher, right? Make sure they're ready when the moment happens. Having a communication plan, of course, Understanding your regulatory and privacy legislation and other rules and um, contractual obligations that you might have with your clients, for example. See that a lot in healthcare and finance when they're your clients because they have strong regulatory um, uh, pressures upon them and they will downdraft that to you. Um, and then, of course, in the end, you want to have your metrics and your reporting um, and run your simulations just like we do here. And this is something that we actually do with our clients. We're just giving you a light taste of it today. The reason that's important is if you can't measure it, you don't actually know how successful you were, right? You have no idea was our response time of days good. Maybe it's not. And you can help benchmark against the industry and you can look at existing cases, particularly where there is a strong regulatory arm, often um, through the Office of Civil Rights and the OCR that runs the HIPAA healthcare um, investigations. They publish those reports. They're a public document. You can read them and you can understand what's happened and in response, what the OCR is looking for from that organization to make themselves whole and protect their, their clients in the future. By doing so, you can actually reverse engineer that and that tells you what you should be doing and how quickly you need to respond. In a way, it's a little bit about, you know, you're almost deducing what reasonable care looks like in these cases. So, we're getting to the scenario here, and if you haven't noticed already, there is a handout link in uh, the GoToMeeting um, control panel. Um, and if you'd like to do play along with the home game version, um, I highly suggest that you download that PDF document quickly if you haven't done it already. Um, it has the background scenario that we're going to go through here. It has the step-by-step -step as the various facts come out. So you can kind of play along, you take notes, do whatever you'd like. So real quick, the scenario is a fictitious law firm named Wolfram and Hart. Um, Wolfram and Hart's a large law firm which operates in uh, many cities, 20 cities across the U.S. They rely heavily on email and cloud sh sharing services. Uh, the cloud sharing is often or predominantly used, of course, when you have much larger file sizes. This is extremely normal um, and very common. Um, they also use various different document formats. Um, they have a secure transfer service. Their network includes primary and backup domain controllers in separate geographic locations, which is a good idea. They used um, virtualized servers such as Office 365. Um, employees can use their personal devices to access network resources, both locally and remotely. And all employees are administrators on their own devices. I realize this is easier for me to say than sometimes for you to do, but that should cause a shudder down your spine, right? That is one of the greatest vulnerabilities you have. 
That said, I often realize in many cases, that's kind of the environment you do have to work in. They also, um, and they also do not employ multi-factor authentication or encryption are not generally used and they are not enforced by policy. All right, so let's dig in here. As I said, we're gonna go fact by fact. And as it emerges, you know, unfortunately, because this, is a, this isn't a forum for, you know, back and forth, I will kind of guide you through it. The point here is to think about some of what the, the potential landmines are and other consequences which you may not have thought of because they don't appear on the face. So let's give you the background here. The law firm has, um, has, uh, has come to the news because they've retained a major client, which is a large US-based weapons manufacturer. And this firm, this manufacturer, has actually recently won a contract to supply weapons to the Ukraine. Now, as we know, the area of Crimea is under tension and turmoil between Russia and the Ukrainian government. Um, and your law firm is, is, is working to, you know, to seal this deal and to help them navigate the, the challenges involved with that. Within one day of this news getting out, the Russian ambassador to the United States makes a public statement stating that this is viewed by Russia as an inflammatory action on the part of the U.S and they demand that the contracts be abandoned or anyone involved will suffer consequences. Again, the facts, the names have been changed, so this may, not be, may or may not be Russia. Um, that said, the threats that were made, the size and the scope and the, the power of the nation state involved um, is, is very representative. So what I would recommend here, you know, nothing's happened, right? There, at this point, there's sort of risk, right? Risk is perhaps increased, but no actual event has occurred that may have done damage yet. Um, but what I would recommend is, you know, this is the time to have that higher level conversation with managing partners and administrators to say, you know, should we be increasing um, security controls? If we don't have certain monitoring places, is that time to add this now, right? Do we want to kind of go to our heightened senses, make sure we lock all the doors and we, you know, we walk around the building, make sure that our, our threat surface is hardened, you know, we've done a good job of that. Um, should you, you know, um, increase users' awareness of the possible issues and review your security patrol, uh, controls and your protocols? I'm gonna tell you the answer to most of these is yes, right? Increasing your users' awareness of the possible issue. I would be sending out internal communications at this point, letting people know, and the people who are directly involved in it, I'd be heightening the monitoring around them. I'd be saying, you have to do a better job right now, right? When Aunt Ruth sends you a, a package from, you know, with UPS tracking number, don't click on it, especially not now, right? You should always be nervous and you should not, you know, there should be a, a sort of a focus of mistrust, you know, guilty until proven innocent here in this case. Um, heighten that. Assume someone is coming after you because they are. Now, of course, a day later, uh, user contacts the IT help desk and they uh, claiming that they've received a suspicious email um, that they would like investigated. When you actually dive into this and your IT term, team does that, it turns out it is a phishing email that's been received by several employees in the firm. So this is good, people are reporting it. And the email message contains a secure file transfer hyperlink. It actually, because it's a standard for you, um, what's interesting and makes you twig here is that the information in this phishing campaign um, is actually tailored to your organization. They know who they're contacting by name, they know the departments or the practices that they work in inside of your firm, and they know the systems you use, right? So this should definitely get the tingling feeling on the back of your neck going, right? Without a doubt. Um, so what should we be doing here? Definitely determine who else in this firm has received this email, right? Um, and notify all those users. So tell the entire broad community, look, this phishing campaign is going around. Take a screen cap of it, and stick it in the email. Tell them not to click on anything, to be highly vigilant right? To verify with a third party source when they say, hey, I just put web files in this safe room on our file transfer server, go get them. Don't use a link. Go in separately, log in, um, not through a hyperlink and validate with that individual that they did send you that email. It does seem like it's a bit of a nuisance, but at least you are going to eliminate um, a lot of the low level risk here. And then the other thing that your IT department should be doing now is getting into the firewall logs to identify which um, users have access to phishing site. This is easy to do and covers off the poor people who don't realize what they've done, haven't read their email, um, or are afraid to acknowledge it and to admit they clicked because they think there may be some kind of dire consequence or punishment um, that they receive um, in return. So third fact, day two here. Um, in reviewing the VPN and the firewall logs as you do, 
you now notice that there's several user sessions that are coming in from Russia, China, Africa, and Germany, and they're occurring off business hours between 1 a.m. and 6 p.m. Interestingly, and this is lucky in your case, um, the analyst also knows that this is very strange because one of the people, one of the users through the VPN system is actually in the Bahamas on vacation when someone uh, purportedly used their account to log in from an IP address associated with Russia. So here you have actually even better, you know, non-IT data here, socially engineered data, um, ironically, that tells you that something is wonky because yes, they should be using your VPN, but it should not be coming from that geography. So here, this is where, as I, I said before, your IR policy should clearly identify the analyst, analyst's responsibilities and their next steps. This has got to go up the flagpole, right? Something is certainly starting to smell bad. Um, you are being targeted, um, and it looks like they're, um, they penetrated, right? They are in. So now you've got to determine how bad is that breach and what are they exploiting? So let's determine if there is a security incident and determine that scale, as I've said, and report it. The other question at this point, and it's interesting doing this live with a group, is to say, should you be uh, suspending remote access services for affected users or for all users? And again, I want you to think about this not in the terms of right and wrong, um, because there isn't necessarily a right and wrong here. You have to balance the needs of the operational requirements of your business. At the same time, you have an obligation to provide adequate security and protect the assets of the firm. So this is, a, this is a question I always throw out. People get into a big debate, and then I just kind of say, you know what, not in your pay grade. Throw this up the chain, right? Bring in somebody else and make them a fiduciary officer should be the one who should be starting to make this call. They should understand what the risks are. That's your job to help them understand that. From there, they have to make the call about what the likelihood of the risk is, what the impact is, and what they're willing to, you know, to suffer as far as the consequence of mitigating that risk or effectively accepting it and moving forward. Now, in this case, it's exactly what did happen. They move forward. Now, as this continues across the day, you're now digging in here deeper. You do find numerous failed VPN attempts occurring um, after the news got out about uh, the deal with the arms manufacturer and the Ukraine. So that kind of, um, we call that baselining and, and, and traffic spiking or bandwidth spiking. That's a good indicator that sets a timeline that says, you know what, some milestone probably occurred here that may be the trigger event, and it does correlate. Um, unfortunately, as you continue to do this work, you find that there's password grabbing software located on your D uh, DNS and DHCP servers. Both um, domain controllers, um, which is highly disturbing, they're on the other side of the country, and you also discover an OWA, which is the um, Outlook's um, web app, Login script has been modified so that when somebody logs in, it collects their user credentials and forwards them to a command and control address in Africa. It also becomes obvious that several sets of user credentials have been compromised um, and that the users, because every person in the, in the um, network has administrative privileges, the, the bad guys have been able to use that administrative privilege to create new accounts and give themselves administrative privilege and move around your network. This is why, of course, that's a bad thing, right? Um, or, you know, we have to do a bit of an animal farm, you know, George Orwell here, where all animals are equal, some are more equal than others, and, you know, making sure you do not have a flat network and that uh, uh, an attorney is an example, their administrative privileges do not give you access to move through your network, right? If they wanna download Skype or a game on their laptop, then, you know, have at, but they sure as heck should not be able to get into your business infrastructure. So here, um, now, really, at this point, I'd be suspending all external and or internal internet access. And unfortunately, we've seen these cases in the news, right? Um, triggering your inter internal communications. You know this is an external actor, so I'd be notifying law enforcement and regulatory authorities and triggering your full incident response investigation um, protocols. This is critical here and is really, really important because at this point, you know it's an external actor. This is a criminal activity. But also from a regulatory perspective, you bought yourself time. You're telling them this is going on, but you don't have full knowledge of what's occurring. So you've met your notification requirements, say in HIPAA, under, you know, within 72 hours, you don't have to have 100% of the information. You've just flagged this. And law enforcement also will step in and because of course they wanna catch the bad guy, are going to um, have some amount of control here, which will loosen the regulatory requirements. 
Um, of course, this gets worse at this point. Um, at the same time, you know, you, uh, your, C your COO tells you that they've now landed your largest client in history. They are going to be using the same system to upload files. This becomes a real debate question, which we can't really have in this forum, but this, this is all about notifications and transparency. You know, do you tell them what's going on? It does not directly affect them. It might, or, or you know, it may just become public and now they're gonna find out after the fact that it occurred and you didn't tell them. I don't have a right answer here. This one is a significant one for debate and I really use this as food for thought as a sort of devil's advocate to say, what are you gonna do here? These are the kind of things that you need to think about. You don't want this one to be a landmine. And frankly, at the end of the day, you also need to be reviewing your contractual obligations to understand what they've, what they've said. If they've said, ah, you know what, if you suspect something, you better tell us, then unfortunately, you're gonna have to tell them. If they haven't done that, now you have the ethical debate. You need to decide what you think they need to know and not know. And, and I've had a lot of different mixed answers on this one. So I, again, don't think it's right and wrong, food for thought. Of course, it gets out. Right, next thing, of course, there's a Twitter posting by a well-known Russian hacking group. The law enforcement that's involved validates that they're real. Um, they claim that they've hacked your firm's network and they posted some files and images just as proof. So first things you wanna do before you panic here, seek confirmation of the claim. Let's make sure they haven't just faked it and made it by sticking your logo on it and it looks good, but it's not real. Um, I would be triggering your crisis communication plan at this point. I'd be considering a press release and I, if you don't have one, but you should, your crisis public relations firm, get them on the horn. This is now public, you're a large enough firm, this is a major deal, it's a political issue, trust me, this is gonna end up, this can end up on the six o'clock news, right? Um, the next step, of course, it also becomes obvious that the key lawyer involved in this deal and his team, um, that, they're, um, that there's remote access tools in the memory, that they have been moving um, devices, or sorry, moving, um, files and so on on that computer and it's been compromised for some time. Um, you also, from this, you're able to validate that the information on Twitter came from this um, device. So at this point, I'd be checking all users on the team for evidence of compromise. I'd be triggering additional internal communication plans, right? Telling people what's going on, what they should or should not do. Um, triggering external communication plans and I'd be going through and sweeping your entire network and devices. This is where endpoint tools come in exceptionally handy, uh, are very, very handy because you can use this remotely to view these logs. You can look at registry files being changed, what files have been accessed on a laptop, what have been changed, et cetera. That helps you determine the magnitude and the scope of what's going on. And of course, just for fun, um, you know, CNN or whatever other news organization contacts your CEO, uh, your, CEO your, your, your managing partner and says, hey, we've read the Twitter feed, we're gonna run a story at six o'clock. We'd love your comment on this. Um, this is a tough one. I want to tell you, you got to get ahead of the media here. You got to post a well-crafted me message. You need to determine who will generate the response message and who's going to deliver it. And there's lots of good advice if you'd like to contact me after on this one about how you handle the press um, and preparation um, and testing of the individual who'll be delivering this. This is nothing but bad, right? Whatever you say here, going off message is only going to cause you problems. So you really have to make sure that the person is confident. And it's tough. It is tough to get on. When that red light goes on on that camera, it's amazing how people's memories fade. They um and ah, and they say all sorts of things they shouldn't. And reporters are good at asking a question, not saying a word, because they know other people will fill the void. The more you say, the more problems you're probably causing yourself. So in the end, um, I know we've got a couple of minutes left here. Lessons learned. I want you to realize here, this happened quickly, right? Intruders did their damage in 12 hours. They fished the VPN credentials. They were able to leverage administrative privileges. They had full access to the network at the administrative level. The service disruption affected 800 users and there was enormous pressure to turn it back on, which they ended up having to do. What's unfortunate was the people who pushed this and the ones who had the most access were the ones um, with the highest risk, the most senior people in the firm. Um, it took multiple analysts uh, days to come through terabytes of data to do this. Luckily, it was detected quickly and the response was fast. As I said, it costs you less when that happens. So some recommendations, this is mostly preventable. Policies work here, logging systems, user education, right? Mobile device management, controlling the use of personal devices, um, huge impact, multi-factor authentication. You can do range blocking of IPs, proper network se segregation. DLP systems may catch some of this. 
Um, and of course, monitoring and endpoint protection is critical here. It really does help you find um, the needle in the haystack and quickly determine what's happening. So we're just gonna wrap up here. Some real quick takeaways. Quick detection, like I said, is critical. Um, having that embedded response, being able to pull the information together for your incident response team also saves time on the clock and will save you money. Planning, getting ahead of the game, and always understanding your obligations and duties before you step into this. So with that, uh, again, um, I thank you for your, our whirlwind tour here, but uh, here's the documents that I talked about, our incident response playbook. If you'd like a copy of that, please contact us through the information in the webinar through the ABA. Um, and with that, I, I thank again our hosts and you for attending, and I turn it back to Austin for questions.